Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, everybody, I can't talk too loud because I've already been warned by my youngest, uh, by his mother. <laughs> that, I said that weird, didn't I? I've already been warned by my son's mother, and I'm referring to the baby, the 10-year-old, that if I talk too loud and wake him up, I will be in trouble. And so I'm trying to um, talk somewhat soft out here. Now, coinpaprika.com, who is one of my sponsors, Looks like Stellar, is, everything's kind of flat, but over the weekend, XRP has done pretty well, and it's looking like it could be an interesting week. Um, I want to remind everybody that Link2, um, they still have the the uh, investment minimum down to $5,000 on Ripple equity, and I think they're I think they're supposed to increase that back up to $10,000. I don't know if it's today or what, but I checked this morning. It was still at $5,000. For anybody that has not looked at that and also and they're one of my sponsors links in the top of the description you can click on it and tell them DAS sent you but I also want to remind you that Uphold who's also one of my sponsors has zero percent commission for Bitcoin and um, you, your Uphold wallet is is that you can link it to your link to wallet and you can literally buy private equity with your Uphold wallet once you prove to them link to that you're accredited so it's really cool. I've done it before. Check it out. Egrag Crypto. Remember, when, <laughs> I thought it was funny. I'm always talking about how I think it's funny when I, I don't know anything about all this charting stuff. But the terms that they use, sometimes I'll see one of the terms like XRP to Valhalla chart. And, and it, I don't know if they're if they're like technical terms or if they're just making up these words because they sound good. But in any event, I like what I see here. Um, XRP to Valhalla chart zooming in. It says that XRP is in wave three. Now, wave three means he's calling for a dollar forty, but it gets real exciting when you get on to wave uh, number five here. Seven fifty six, three thirty a pullback, I guess, and then seven as high as twenty seven dollars. I'm into wave seven. I'd like to get there. Then we've got more fake awards today. Today, um, uh, CNBC was celebrating Ben Bernanke getting an we award. We got some breaking news, big news. Uh, big news. There's only, there's only not a person who necessarily uh, would be our, our, our audience, but former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, one of the winners of the 2022 Nobel Prize for Economics. Bernanke. This is what they do. They, they, they build monuments to themselves. Now, I remember this guy very clearly. He's the one, one of the ones that presided over the financial crisis and helped engineer the bailouts. And this is what we got for, for his uh, awesome work in economics. Now our debt is at over $31 trillion, which back in the financial crisis, I was saying, well, this is where this ends. They're going to bail out their friends, and then they're never going to pay off any of this debt. And then 10 years down the road, we're all screwed. And then they give themselves awards. So if you want to throw up, there's your throw up of the day. Okay. Now, this is an interesting video right here. This is Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary. Listen to what she says. The world cannot afford to delay or lower our ambitions. The current challenges are urgent. And that is why I, along with leaders from a broad group of countries, will be calling on World Bank management at the annual meetings next week to work with shareholders to develop a World Bank evolution roadmap by December. Deeper work should begin by the spring. Shareholders will then need to drive parallel holistic reform efforts across other development banks as well. To accelerate this work, my team will step up our engagement with World Bank shareholders and management. And we look forward to discussing more details on this project in the coming weeks. Now, um, 
this is what immediately came to my mind when I when I saw this. This is a, this is a document from the WorldBank.org that was going around a while back from November 2021. Central Bank Digital Currencies. Now, what do we know about the XRP Ledger and Stellar? Is that both of these companies, both of the both Ripple and Stellar, are working with central banks around the world. We know that Stellar is is the the uh, experiment, whatever you call it, experiment, whatever, in Ukraine on a central bank digital currency was going to be built on Stellar. We know that Ripple at various times has been working with as many as 50 central banks around the world to build CBDCs. And then this was in the World Bank Group's documents on this, uh, uh, talking about central bank currencies. And it says, stable coins for cross-border payment. Now, folks... This is not just some, you know, couple of words where, oh, okay, they made a mistake. They're referring to XRP and XLM as stable coins. And there's an entire write-up on this. It's not just a couple of words. So it's not like they don't understand it or something like that. And they say stable coins refer to a class of digital currencies that are relatively stable in terms of their price. I guess relatively stable. I'm hoping it won't be relatively stable when this SEC thing's over. But, and then, and then the same group of people that Janet Yellen pals around with, the World Bank, same people is the Christine Lagarde of the World European Central Bank. Listen to what she, this is an older video too, but listen. And those who um, survive, but it will be between those who are cannibalized because they are not seeing it coming and they're not embracing it. And those who self-induce that cannibalization, and I'm using cannibalization on purpose because it's a bit of a striking, horrible word, but it's really what it means. It's you're going to disrupt your business model, you're going to change it, you're going to reduce your cost, you're going to expedite your transactions, and you're going to continue to inspire confidence because you will build that on the basis of an existing backbone, which is your bank and the confidence relationship that you've established with your customers. So that's where I see changes happening now. If you think of circle and ripples and all those, that, that's where they are active and, and uh, helpful. All right. Then there was this video going around uh, this week. No, I showed you a video the other day where the guy was trying to infer that, um, that circle uh, was, which we do know is Goldman Sachs back is, is a competitor to XRP because circles USDC is a stable coin. I thought it was a kind of bizarre video, but here, here's Brad Garlinghouse and Jeremy Lair sitting beside each other. As we've seen over three and a half trillion dollars of transactions directly on the internet between counterparties. And, and so um, if we can you know, improve it with more scalable blockchain technologies like you know, Brad's company uh, provides, and we can make this extremely low cost to, to move, uh, and then enable individuals with digital wallets that can, uh, that can interact, and you can scale into the risk, right, is, is the way I like to think of it. But at a base layer, if you want to solve for this problem, governments have to accept that people want digital cash. That is a product that they want. And from a remittance perspective, that's critical. That's the, if, if you want to educate someone and say, hey, you should do this digitally, they want to know, is this as good as cash? Is, can someone turn it off? Can they turn it off? Is it as good as, 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 as what I get when I get cash? And I think we need to answer that question definitively as a society if we want to uh, solve this remittance problem. Okay, so that's interesting. Now, um, <laughs> we're going to revisit this. Look, folks, Charles Hoskinson keeps doubling down on, on this thing. History is not going to be kind to him here. And the more I see of, of him doing this, I'm, I'm getting two vibes here. One vibe I'm getting is that this guy has some kind of, what would you call it, a superiority complex. I mean, I, I can't even begin to tell you how disappointed I am in in Charles Hoskinson and this this because he. It's almost like out of pure stubbornness, he's backed himself into a corner and just doesn't. He, he, it, I'm surprised that he appears to be one of those guys who just can't admit it when he's wrong. And I think that that is pretty shameful, especially as much of a following as he has on this thing because he's just flat wrong. Now he's explaining to John how, although you're an attorney, 
Uh, I know more than you do, is the, is the way I read it. You're arguing with someone who has spent years, I mean, I, I almost need to read this in such a way where it's like, oh, the arrogance coming off of this is making me nauseated. You're arguing with someone who has spent years fighting government corruption. From the audit of the Fed days and calling out the COVID madness, it's okay to be angry about selective enforcement. It's literally institutionalized bit license. But proper steps need to be taken. John, you're just not as sophisticated as me. I mean, that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting the EBGBs now, but don't worry because John Deaton, he, he, John Deaton's a gunslinger and he's not, John Deaton knows when he's right and he knows when he's wrong. He's willing to admit it. Here he admits a time when he was wrong and then I'll show you him on fire talking about Charles Hoskinson. One second. You guys were right and, and you guys were right and I was wrong. And, and I'm sorry, say that again. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, I can admit, dude, I'm wrong sometimes, right? So, uh, you guys were right and I was wrong because, and I'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. If you recall the last time I was on your show, I said that, listen, we don't, we haven't seen the SEC brief yet. We haven't seen all the evidence yet. And I actually predicted that the SEC would have a couple gyms against Ripple. And I said, it may be a couple bad days of publicity for Ripple. I don't know if you remember me saying that. I oh, said, yeah. but, you know, we haven't seen all the evidence and there's got to be more that I'm missing. Now, that was a, an assumption I was making. Like, this can't be it. And then I spread the, the summary judgment and I said, holy shit, <laughs> there's nothing there. Like, there's no more egregious conduct behind the scenes. There was, you know, it was, well, here's an email of course, no XRP holder would be privy to this stuff. Here's an email where Chris Larson said, I love it because an employee said, hey, XRP holders like something, right? Or this or that. Well, none of that stuff is out there. All that complaint says, guys, is that Ripple promoted the shit out of Ripple and Ripple promoted XRP. That's it. All right. And then this is the clip where John is on fire um, and by the way, this is from uh, these guys from On The Chain, Chip On The Chain, and then um, Jeff, the, the, give these guys a follow. And they also have a YouTube channel. If you go to their um, Twitter, they've got YouTube, the link hooked up there. Listen to this clip. This is great. And so it was kind of bizarre for me to, to understand why Charles was, was calling me out on something that I've been saying exactly what he's saying. You know, and I, I took issue and I will take issue. Listen, if Chris Larson or Brad Garlinghouse said this, I wouldn't hesitate to say to them, correct them, if they're going to call something a conspiracy or grand conspiracy when it is 100 percent factual. And so what I was saying to Charles is, you know, since we aren't bringing that up in the Ripple case and we are doing the way we're supposed to in Congress and using our elected officials, when you say that, all those people that send a message to Congress, it's undermining them. When Empower Oversight, which doesn't own XRP, owns no crypto, has nothing to do with John Deaton, when they fight for transparency in our government, they sue the SEC, expend time and resources, catch the SEC in a lie, get 1,200 emails that conclusively prove, conclusively prove that Bill Hinman violated the law. It's not an allegation, people. It's a fact, okay? When you then say it's a grand conspiracy, you're undermining all of that effort and energy. Because your voice is so much more po important. I don't know if it's important, more powerful. Your voice is one of the single most important people in crypto, a founder of Eve, a, a co-founder of Eve, a founder of Cardano. When you speak... Founder of Eve. That might be why he's being so vocal. The, uh, folks, let's not forget, Charles Hoskinson was the CEO of whatever they called it when they founded ETH, even though he left early, as he always likes to say, and even though he didn't take any money, as he likes to say, that doesn't mean that Charles Hoskinson does not know of things like, for instance, JP Morgan's early involvement in Ethereum. We, Charles Hoskinson, since he's wanting to talk so much, he should be want, wanting to get on the... Uh, See this. See this will be the tell. See this is what people aren't really thinking about. 
Yeah, this is a debate over what John's talking about right here. But the, here's the question. Is, because do you know, how many, you know how many questions about the early days of ETH that Charles Hoskinson knows that have never been said? Does he know? I mean, Joseph Lubin said that, that J.P. Morgan was there before the public main net launch. Charles Hoskinson himself said that they had senior Goldman Sachs programmers. Just that one topic alone, you get him on a on a on a Zoom where somebody's like asking him real questions about things like this. I want to see if he's willing to answer them, and if he's not, why not? Because I I, I just I, my gut is my my spidey senses are tingling here because there's a reason. Because this doesn't make sense. John Deaton's kind of saying it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that Charles Hoskinson is coming out with the stance he is. And the fact that he is gives my spot makes my spidey senses start tingling and thinking, is he, is this guy not wanting is he wanting this spotlight to be turned off? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Because all we have is is legit questions that we've pieced and these questions all are derived from people like Joseph Lubin running their mouth. So, okay, let us ask some questions. He can come on here anytime. And I, I've, got, I've got a whole laundry list of, of specific questions where he can say, oh, yeah, that's conspiracy. That's not conspiracy. That is anytime. Anytime. And I, it, see, here's the beautiful thing. I don't care how smart Charles Hoskinson is. These are factual things. So just to answer the questions, what where was J.P. Morgan in all of this? If they were there before the public mainnet, I'm, I really want to know that. Plus, we've got a timeline. We can go through and ask all kinds of very specific questions. Did you did you ever meet this person? Were they there? What about that Stephen? Remember the Stephen Neryoff guy who said that his job was to keep them out of jail? What was the interaction there? Who else was there when this was going on? Was Andreessen Horowitz there in Switzerland when they were having all these discussions? There's all kinds of, there's a whole freaking can of worms here. Here, let's let John finish. So many more people listen to you than they're going to listen to me. Because you're more important than I am in the crypto world. You're more important than all those people as far as your voice, right? And so it's frustrating because it's like, Charles, don't do that. And that's all I was trying to do. And, and, and so I think, unfortunately, Charles doesn't know me. I'm assuming, and he, nor should he. Um, he doesn't know all that effort. And, um, you know, maybe he's confusing me with these trolls on Internet who say to him. And that's another point. I'm not saying anything ugly to this guy. I'm not uh, saying anything mean or like that. I'm just disagreeing with what he's saying. I'm not threatening the guy or anything, or I, and I don't and I don't condone anything like that. I want. I have a. I, we have probably thousands of specific questions that we could ask about what happened when Ethereum was founded. <laughs> thousands of them, probably. That, that Charles could answer and 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 um and if he wasn't willing to answer him, I'd be asking why. Dig up information on him. That's not us. That's not the entire XRP community. I don't stand for that. And so that's was like it's like the bizarro world for me to 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 face that. And so the last thing I'll say on it, guys, is let me make this clear. I want everyone to understand that there is no conspiracy. There is no conspiracy. That is a that is a thumbnail. There is no conspiracy. And he kept saying bizarro world. Uh, it is. It is bizarre because Charles Hoskinson is a lot more clear thinking than that. And then this was an interesting tweet John had sent out. Someone made a searchable website showing real identities and their crypto holdings lost in the Celsius bankruptcy. I won't tweet the link out myself, but this happened to get, but how this happened to get out is beyond me. DeFi will eventually take over if we don't let them kill it. I'm going to end by saying I still say Charles Hoskins is one of the good guys and, and everybody, everybody makes mistakes. But if I'm Charles Hoskins and I'm not, this is not the corner that I want to have put myself into. It's easy. It's not very difficult to admit you made a mistake. 
I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and ask your friends and family exactly where what was J.P. Morgan doing before the public Ethereum mainnet launch? What were they doing there? Who were they talking to? These are the kind of things I'm dying to know. Thanks for listening.